Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. On Saturday we have usually elderly generations, so I was testing if was any one of them over 97 years old. I think we lost this over 100 people. So nobody remembers uh, this, our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe, that was not present in the church because uh, it was not that long ago. Uh, the Feast of Christ the King was instituted by Pope Pius XI in 1925. In the liturgy of the Vatican Council, it was moved universally on the countries for the last Sunday of the liturgical year, just to make sure that we remember that the last word belongs to God, and to be tuned with God, we have to put Jesus to enfront him in our hearts, first of all. I will present you a few sentences from this encyclical letter, because on the one side is instruction, on the other side it could be even terrified what is now our state. You might see a bit of archaic language. In the first encyclical letter which we addressed at the beginning of our pontificate to the bishops of the Universal Church, you see immediately he is using this pluralis majesticum, this what we and the Holy Spirit decided like it was written in the Acts of the Apostles, and he's writing to the bishops. You remember the last encyclicals, especially from John Paul II, they are written to all the people, to all the faithful. He was not neglecting the people, he was like keeping the structure. He is writing to the bishops, the bishops should transfer the message to the priest, the priest should transfer the message to the people. It was never meant just only for one group. And look what he wrote. We referred to the chief causes of the difficulties under which mankind was laboring. This is after the very first World War. This is time between the First and Second World War. And both Popes, Benedict XV before Pius XI and then Pius XII, they were trying to protect humanity from the next disaster, to shake them, to bring them to their senses. So he wrote, and we remember saying that these manifold evils in the world were due to the fact that the majority of men had thrust Jesus Christ and his holy law out of their lives. And this is 1925. I survived under the communist regime removing the crosses from hospitals, from schools. Just see what is happening in the world. Have we ever learned anything? Because there was disaster just few years later. That this had no place either in private affairs or in politics. This is what they are trying to guarantee us freedom of worship, not going into the world and practice your faith. And this, what Pope Pius XI is saying, was the main cause for disaster. You remove the light, you are automatically in darkness. You don't put Jesus as a guiding light, you don't know where you are going. And if you compare that time to ours, there is hardly anything to compare. And we said further that as long as individuals and states refuse to submit to the rule of our Savior, there would be no really hopeful prospect of a lasting peace among the nations. Men must look for the peace of Christ in the kingdom of Christ. Just see what is happening in our days. This is 1925. There was no even division between the Christian churches on the issue of divorce, on contraception, on abortion. Everybody was saying it's unacceptable. Pornography. You know, some people, this multi-billion business, the lawyers, they're allowing it the destruction of the population, moral destruction. The first crack in the morality in Christianity was in 1930, when the Anglican Church approved contraception and divorce. They let the lion out of the cage. Oh, it's not that easy to put the lion back into the cage. 
And Pope Pius XI wrote, that time, if we don't convert, there will be another disaster. And that we promise to do as far as lies our powers or put Christ in front of your eyes, on the front of your heart. In the kingdom of Christ, that is, it seems to us that peace could not be more effectually restored nor fixed upon a firmer basis than through the restoration of the empire of our Lord. So unless we put ourselves under the rules of God, nothing will work. Of course it's your life. You can do whatever you want with your life. But is this like buying some new gadget which you do not know how functions and you ignore completely the manual instruction? Okay, you might be lucky that you will learn how to operate it, but you are also risking to destroy it completely. In the early 1920s, we have just come out of the First Great War War. This massive conflict of nations in which untold number of human beings were killed, especially in Europe, even before the US was joining this. Uh, Pope Benedict XV, who was before Pius XI, he was so much warning not to make too harsh retribution on the Germans, because not only there were guilty of this war, because if you make it intolerable, they will revolt. There will be the next war. This was long before the war even happened. The Pope is saying that the chief reason for all of that evil of the beginning of the 20th century is that people have thrust the kingship of Christ. So what would you say now? What punishment would be now? I'm very much convinced there's an absolutely growing number of people who are praying, who are sacrificing, because if not, it would be already gone. There was a French theologian, Jean Guiton, during the Vatican Council, a very good guy, and he kind of prophesied. He said that the 21st century will be the most devout, most spiritual century, or there will be no 21st century. And see what you are standing. So with the spread of atheism, communism and socialism, it was for the first time in a very long time in Europe's history, over 1500 years that time, that the Christian nations were establishing themselves without any reference to the reign of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Of course, the German nation was mocking God mit uns, God with us, and they were using it to conquer humanity, all the world. But after the Second World War, when they realized that this was the cause, or oh, they were quite sure, they took the children out of the control of parents. They put God out completely out of the, any social or political way. After the Second World War, they got it. This left remnant, when they were writing their uh, constitution, there were two very significant points in German constitution. The first one, that the German forces cannot operate outside of Germany. So they can defend themselves, but they cannot go outside. And the second, and maybe should be mentioned as the first, in the preamble of this introduction to the Constitution, they put God at the first place. This was the lesson after the Second World War. You know that they removed it? When the European Union came, they removed it from their Constitution? Just look how slowly or how hardly we are learning. In that context, Pope Pius XI instituted the solemnity of Jesus Christ, the King of the Universe. Coming to today's Gospel, which is the greatest image of God left by Jesus? Remember, Jesus had this unique insight into the heart of God, being God, and he had this also full insight in our humanity, assuming the human nature. So he could give examples which no one would even dare to say, you can have your own favorite image, but this is really something special which we heard in the Gospel. A criminal was dying as a capital punishment for his crimes, just judgment. Everybody considered him to be a disgrace, a scum of the world. You know, he shouldn't even exist in our society. So this criminal turned to Jesus at the last moment, very last moment of his life and said, do you have any room in your kingdom for a person like me. This was his whole doing that he could turn to Jesus. 
In response, Jesus turned to the dying sinner and says, This very day, the day of your execution, you whom all people consider to be a villain, you will be with me, the blessed Son of God, in paradise. <laughs> we would not even invent any of these examples. So there is no such desperate situation that God cannot do it. That's the face of God for us. And only, only God can do something like this out of the wasted life. There is hardly any possibility on the human level to justify a life of a criminal. And still, out of this life, making an invitation, an example, <laughs> encouragement, turn to me. Only Jesus could do this. Give hope and joy to all people in desperate need, in desperate situation. So what is your image of God? Confronted with this, it's straight from Jesus' mouth, straight from his action. So this is one of Luke's unique contribution to the Passion narratives. This dialogue between Jesus and this criminal crucified on his right side, it's only reported in the Gospel of Luke. And Luke asks his readers to place themselves at the cross and choose which way would you go. For here is a real choice. There in the center is the Lamb of God, the Davidic Messiah King, the Son of God, the Son of Man, dying to save us all, paying a frightful price to open the gates of paradise to forgiven sinners. As many times he was talking to his special friends, to saints, and Jesus was challenging, if this, if my death, my passion, will not convince you about my love for you, what would? Jesus hang between a sinner who accepts and one who rejects. Such is a mystery of the freedom in human choices. There's a quite a circulating saying all over the world that the suffering brings people closer to God. Yes and no. I mean, in majority of the cases, yes, because very often people who left the church and then suddenly found themselves in the misery, the one of the first things they found they know is the church. <laughs> they, they know where to go. But it's not always. What this other guy, crucified on the left side, had to lose? To turn to Jesus. And as far as we know, he didn't. Both these men find themselves in the same circumstances, with the same opportunity for grace, but with a very different result. It's kind of training, it's kind of education to learn, to code, to turn to God, especially in a serious situation. Yet Jesus made no distinction between them. Jesus did not reject the one who reviled him. There's no any indication of it. So he could also, this criminal, he could also be covered under this umbrella of Jesus' heroic forgiveness if he would just turn to him. So Jesus responded incredibly to the good will of the so-called good thief, whose only good deed was to turn to Jesus in the nick of time. And it is very good example of salvation as a reward for faith and good intentions. Remember this uh, so-called good thief? He was not baptized. He was not confirmed, receiving Holy Communion, coming to the church. There was no time for it. In the last moment of his life, he turned to Jesus and this was enough. So this very day, the day of your execution, you whom all people consider to be a villain, You'll be with me, the blessed Son of God in paradise. You can put yourself in the shoes of the Heavenly Father. Maybe you had something similar experience at home. You see your child returning from the school and the child is bringing a new friend. And you just think, oh gosh, can't you afford someone better? <laughs> this was the guy who entered first to paradise. Not Mother Mary, Joseph or any one of them. The guy who just turned in last minute to Jesus. Luke portrays Jesus forgiving sinners and accepting outcasts into the kingdom right up to the very end. When he couldn't make any other action, he was still able and willing to save the souls. 
This crucified prodigal son was about to be embraced by the father in his eternal home because he turned to Jesus. This must have been the obvious consolation offered by a merciful father, heavenly father, to his dying son, Jesus. He could still find the lost sheep and bring in strays of the streets into the eternal banquet, even being crucified. So his love had conquered yet again. And it's not by chance that this gospel we have on the Sunday of the Jesus King of the Universe, because that's what is needed. That's what we need to put him as a reigning king of our life. So why this feast of Christ the King is so important for us to remember? In the modern world, Jesus Christ isn't just our personal Lord and Savior, as, as many, especially Protestant denominations, are insisting. Yeah, it's, it's clear, he is. But he's not just a divine Son of God, he's also the King of the universe. I like this uh, way of explanation Father Ricardo was in his book saying when, about the narratives of the creation when God created heaven and earth and he created sun and moon. And by the way, he created also stars. How many stars did he create? Billions of stars? Billions of galactics? Or oh, just by the way? <laughs> Pope Pius XI said very clearly, some men went even further and wish to set up in the place of God's religion a natural religion consisting in some instinctive affection of the heart. Oh, you will feel so great. Don't hurt his feeling. Seventy some, or maybe even more, transgenders? What a nonsense. There was even some nations who thought they could dispense with God and that their religion should consist in impiety, and the neglect of God. That time, 1925, there was already the Soviet Union in full power. They totally rejected God. They decimated clergy, closed the churches, mocking the churches. They make the museums of atheism. So the rebellion of individuals and states against the authority of Christ has produced deplorable consequences. Looking at this disaster, even Pope Benedict XVI he was born 1927. Even he is saying that this word doesn't seem as the same to his young age. Look, I don't intend to, to terrify you. I invite you to keep praying. Because if we stop praying, the disaster is around the corner. A blind and immoderate selfishness making men seek nothing but their own comfort and advantage. I heard on one conference from this National Sanctuary of Divine Mercy, Father Chris was there pleading that abortion was somehow imposed on the people, allowed the people by the state, by the judges. So it was not chosen by the people, it was allowed to the people by the decision of authorities. What kind of excuse can you have now? In last elections, just in Michigan, over half a million people voted for abortion up to the day of birth. What would be the excuse? You choose the culture of death and you expect life? Few days ago, on the brink of the Third World War, because some missiles, nobody knew that time, came to Poland, attacking NATO. Now the missile landed on the shores of Japan from Korea. I mean, keep praying. Take it seriously. The unity and stability of the family undermined. Society in the world shaken to its foundations and on an all the ways to ruin. That time. In some way this pandemic or a blessing, this is what they didn't expect, this great reset people. Because finally parents started to pay attention to what the children are taught in the school. So we firmly hope that the feast of the kingship of Christ, which in the future will be yearly observed, may hasten the return of society to our loving Savior. Pope Pius XI was reminding that not only do we need Christ as individuals, that the world needs to recognize Jesus Christ as the King of the universe, following the manual instruction, following the Bible. 
So Jesus said to St. Faustina in 1934, mankind will not have peace until it turns with trust to my mercy. And practically, since Fatima, since the First World War, there was never peace. Ukraine war now. Just a few months, peace and another war, and another tension. Will we ever learn? But don't worry. Whether it happened today, tomorrow, or on the last day, St. Paul says in the letter to the Philippians, every knee should bend in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God, the Father. Last word belongs to God. But we can bring the light of God to our lives, to our circumstances and the place where we live, and even if we don't manage to conquer all the evil, we might have the satisfaction, I didn't add my darkness to the darkness of the world, my sin to the sin of the world. I was appealing for grace and light of God to count our lives. Remember this magic word, mercy, or Jesus, I trust in you. This might save whole eternity.